Now we turn to our keynote speaker of the day, Mitchell Anderson. Mitchell Anderson is a Vancouver-based freelance writer and frequent contributor to the TAI. His research focuses on resource pricing and sustainability. In 2002, the TAI sent him on assignment to Norway to learn more about their oil fund that currently has more than 900 billion in assets. He wrote a 10-part series comparing petroleum policies in Norway and Canada, which shed the light on the question of why Canada, with our vast natural resources, is not a wealthier country. Please welcome, help me welcome uh, Mitchell, please. Oh, sure great. It will go back. And the laser is over to one side. Nifty. I get to laser uh, Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> so I'll put it back to your first slide. There you go. Great. That's better. Thanks very much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. And... Um, and writing is often kind of a lonely pursuit, and it's a real uh, pleasure to go out and uh, talk about some of the stuff that I'm writing about and uh, answer some of your questions if you have them. Uh, as, um, as was said, I've been very interested in resource pricing for quite a while, uh, and the title of my talk is Where Does Money Come From? And I know the, the one percenters of the world tend to give money a bad name, but it's also what pays for social services and schools and hospitals and roads. And the lack thereof often is given as a rationale for cutting back on uh, all of the, the trappings of, you know, um, a civil society. Uh, and uh, here in Canada, obviously, we should be a very wealthy nation, and uh, which is why I'm asking why is it that the se second wealthiest country in the world can't afford postal delivery? So I'd like to start with a... Um, quote from Margaret Thatcher, who, uh, for better or worse, was a thought leader in the 20th and 21st century, and uh, one of her famous quotes is, there's no such thing as public money, there's only taxpayers' money, which is, you know, a worldview that has uh, permeated a lot of what we read in the papers these days, that, you know, governments, their only role is to, like, um, tax the private sector and basically steal money away from people that are actually creating money, but it really kind of begs the question, where does money come from? And uh, reading the paper, you might get the idea that money comes from the financial sector, people on Bay Street or Wall Street or pushing around zeros and ones and uh, are, are getting uh, compensated to oftentimes an obscene extent. But uh, I think most people in this room realize that you know, to a large extent, money uh, comes from resources. And uh, Canada is an incredibly wealthy country. Uh, we don't have many people in it. And uh, by that yardstick, we should be a very wealthy country. Um, I do a lot of uh, research and writing, and the internet is an incredible tool for writing. Um, my mother was a writer, and she used to have um, um, a file cabinet full of press clippings, and she would read the paper every day and uh, cut out um, press clippings on topics that she was interested in and file them away, and I couldn't imagine how much work that was. And these days, you can just Google almost anything, and this is a study that I found um, which uh, compares the resource wealth of the top 10 countries in the world. Uh, and it's interesting. I was surprised that Canada only came out at number four. Uh, but uh, if uh, you look closely at that, where the people that did this study valued Canada's resources at about $33 trillion. And uh, the people that uh, did this work only considered Canada's petroleum resources and, and our wood resources. And uh, wood was uh, apparently worth about $10 trillion, and our petroleum was worth about 23 But there's more than one way to look at this. On a per capita basis, if you divide that wealth by the number of people in all those countries, Canada is actually the second wealthiest country in the world, right after Saudi Arabia. Which kind of begs the question, why is it that we are in this sort of period of what I call incremental austerity, where it's sort of in this slow frog boiling period where we're expected to expect less from our public institutions, uh, less from governments, uh, less of almost everything. For instance, just last year, uh, 
the new normal was that uh, Canada's Canadians are, are not going to get door-to-door uh, -door delivery in all parts of our country. Um, this is um, a news item that I found uh, from 2013. Um, I'll read it out for people that uh, can't read it. Fort McMurray could cut school week down to just four days. Now, this was a really interesting uh, story, and it didn't really make any kind of national news, but I just thought it was such a, an excellent metaphor for uh, this sort of uh, very odd situation that Canada finds itself in. What had happened was that the Fort McMurray School District uh, was considering shorting their school week down to four days a week. Why? Because the jurisdiction that includes one of the largest deposits of fossil fuels on the planet couldn't afford to hire school bus drivers five days a week. Yeah, I'm not kidding. And again, this was not greeted with uh, universal public outrage uh, or indignation in Alberta. This was just normal. Uh, and, you know, people were of the opinion, well, you know, everybody's got to cut back and we all have to cut corners. Uh, and the reason they decided not to um, shorten the school week to four days a week is because oil sands workers had no access to childcare uh, for the fifth day. So what are they supposed to do with their kids? Uh, and they couldn't get the day off. And, you know, some people were even voicing the idea, well, you know, these kids have to learn that you have to go out and, you know, put in a five-day week like the rest of us, so, you know, they shouldn't get a day off. So it sort of begs the question, like, what happened to our country? And um, I think that the debate around issues like this in Canada has become sort of uh, not even so polarized, so cartoonish that I really wanted to kind of step outside our country into a sort of so-called alternate universe to, to look at a country that was scaling up their petroleum sector at around the same time we were and arrived at a very different place. And, I mean, I've, it's kind of bizarre, and believe me, the Taiyi does not pay a lot of money for writing, and, uh, and that's in, in, in indirectly how I ended up going there. Uh, they, um, I often, but they pay so little, I just forgot to invoice them for 18 months. And um, <laughs> I'm not kidding. So I went and talked to the editor, and I said, listen, David, I'm really sorry. There's some stuff that uh, I wrote last year I forgot to bill you for. And, uh, you know, I know you can't dip into the last fiscal year. Why don't we just write that stuff off? And he, uh, we kind of had this anti-negotiation where he said, no, we can find the money. And eventually he said, well, I'll tell you what, you've been bugging and sort of joking us to send you to Norway for, you know, the last six months. Why don't we send you to Norway? They had a little money left over in a travel budget. So uh, off I went, and uh, the reason I wanted to go there uh, was that, um, as was mentioned, Norway uh, started something called the Sovereign Wealth Fund. So uh, all their petroleum revenues go into a sort of a, a firewall fund that uh, is insulated from general revenue. Uh, and the Norwegians have been salting money away in there since the early 1990s, and um, they've actually just crossed a trillion dollars. They're saving uh, about a billion dollars a week. Uh, and because of that, they have a very different culture and country than we do here in Canada. Uh, and I wrote a 10-part series for the TAIE. I'm uh, still writing on the subject. As a matter of fact, I, have, um, I was just finishing off an article on the ferry that's going to be published tomorrow in the TAIE on uh, the, the latest chapter of Alberta's oil history, given the collapse in the price of oil. Uh, but this seemed to have started sort of a, a public discussion, which I'm very happy about. I, you know, it, to me, it was kind of crazy that, you know, a very small uh, publication like Taiyi was like the first in Canada to send a correspondent over to Norway to cover this story. Uh, and um, it has uh, generated um, increasing public discussion, which I'm very happy about. This was an infographic that was making the rounds around... Um, uh, Facebook, and it's also an excellent example of what not to include in a PowerPoint presentation given the size of the text, but I'll try and read some of the stuff out to you, and I'll see if this little laser works. Is that it? No? Right. To the left. Ah, there it is. Good. Uh, so this large piggy bank here, this is a little dated. This is how much money they have in their sovereign wealth fund, which is uh, at the time they made this $905 billion. Um, this uh, small little pig over here is a sovereign wealth fund that was started by the province of Alberta uh, in the 1970s. It was, uh, they, I think they made the first deposit in it in 1976, and I'm sure most of you remember the Alberta Heritage Fund. Well, interestingly, um, they haven't deposited any oil revenue into the Alberta Heritage Fund since 1987. 
and uh, it still has only $17 billion, and they're still taking money out of it. Uh, it's legally mandated to be adjusted for inflation, but, you know, basically, given the, uh, the increase in the population of Alberta, it's just worth less and less. And because of that, Alberta is in a real pickle. Now, the reason um, this graphic compares Alberta and Norway, which is ac actually much fairer than uh, comparing uh, uh, Norway to Canada, um, because, uh, you know, under our constitution, it's not Canada's oil, it's Alberta's oil. And, uh, of course, Alberta has been reminding the rest of the country of that for quite a long time. Um, but, you know, by the same token, Alberta has the prerogative uh, and the responsibility to set their own resource policies and their own resource rents, as does British Columbia in the use of our resources. Uh, so, really, the situation Alberta is in is of their own making. Uh, and Norway, on the other hand, because they have uh, so much money in the bank, has no public debt, they have no deficits, they have uh, social programs that Canadians could only dream of, including uh, uh, free university tuition. Uh, and, you know, again, they, even if oil was worth nothing tomorrow, uh, and it seems to be heading in that direction, uh, the Norwegians would have a trillion dollars in the bank uh, to transition to a new economy. Uh, and, uh, you know, just as an aside, the, the rhetorical temperature in Norway was so much lower than the kind of the shrill debates we have here in Canada, partly because the population in Norway knows that everyone is benefiting from the management of their um, oil industry. Uh, and, and it's also, you know, quite transparent. It's very well managed. And I even had a sit down with uh, Greenpeace in Oslo, and uh, we met for so long we had to order pizza because uh, we were getting hungry. And um, the, um, one of the chaps that I met with, he bought me a coffee cup uh, that uh, we were sort of chuckling over because it was from the National Police Force. And uh, he is invited to address the cadets in the uh, National Police Force Academy every year to talk about environmental issues and also the work that Greenpeace does, which is illegal because they're, you know, uh, doing civil disobedience. And he uses that as an opportunity to say, well, we're here and we're not going away and this is the kind of work we do and this is the kind of police response we expect. And, you know, we just want to keep the lines of communication open and respectful so nobody gets hurt. And, and it's just it's such a different place than Canada. They were describing an instance where... They had visited uh, Fort McMurray with some um, investors from Scandinavia, and they checked into their hotel and went and had dinner, and uh, came back, and the key cards in their hotel room didn't work. And um, there was a note uh, in their, on their door uh, from the RCMP that they wanted to talk to them right away. So they went down to the police station. They had to sit down at the RCMP, and uh, they said, so what are you guys doing here? We said, well, we're from Greenpeace. We're here with some Scandinavian investors, and we're here to educate them on our view of what's happening in the oil sands. And the RCMP allegedly, um, apparently, uh, just uh, produced a bunch of uh, emails that they had illegally accessed and uh, to show, demonstrate to the guys in Greenpeace they were spying on them and said, okay, well, that kind of adds up to what we have here. Well, just keep your nose clean in our town. And uh, the, the guys from Greenpeace couldn't believe it. You know, they were quite polite, as Norwegians typically are, but they thought it was, in their words, unusual that uh, our state police force seemed to be spying on them on behalf of uh, oil companies. So, um, sorry, my clicker doesn't seem to work. Down. Down. Hmm, battery dead? Hmm. Oh. The light's working. No, there's Margaret Thatcher again. Oh, that's up. Okay. Sorry, I'm new at this. Oh, it's up and down. Thank you. Ah, good. There I am. Very good. So I'm going to talk more about Canada in a little while, but I thought I would say a few more words about the UK. Um, this is another quote from Margaret Thatcher. Uh, and she said, this was just before she was elected Prime Minister, the problem with socialism is that you all eventually run out of other people's money. Um, and uh, interestingly, uh, the UK was scaling up uh, the, their side of the North Sea oil deposits at exactly the same time that Norway was. And I can actually think of uh, no better real-world um, uh, experiment uh, on competing uh, economic and ideological worldviews than Norway and the UK and the development of North Sea oil. 
Uh, and I wrote a piece on this, and I crunched the numbers, and I'm not sure anyone else has, but um, it turns out that um, Norway had come out ahead of the UK about uh, $658 billion dollars for the development of the same resource at the same time and dealing with the same companies. And uh, the UK, tragically, has is, is saved nothing of their uh, North Sea oil revenues. And uh, their uh, debt to GDP radio ratio, as economists are fond of saying, is now over 90%, which means that uh, their debt level is um, very dangerous, and, and certainly in comparison to Norway. I just wanted to say a few things about this slide to try and explain how Norway extracted so much more public revenue from the use of uh, their oil resource than the UK did, because it's, um, it's a good example of uh, uh, what Canada could be doing uh, better as well. Oh, there we are. So um, for those who can see, this uh, blue bar here, this whole bar is Norway, and this is the UK, and uh, this is the North Sea oil revenues uh, to 2011. Um, so this blue bar is taxation, which uh, is kind of the simplest way of extracting money from uh, public resource. And uh, the Norwegians collected $156 billion more in taxes than the UK. Uh, and when I was in um, Norway, I had a meeting with uh, a historian at the University of Oslo. And um, the Norwegians were famously tough at dealing with foreign oil companies. And I'll tell you a little story about that later on. Uh, and I asked him, you know, there must have been, you know, some kind of political debate, uh, you know, as there is in Canada about whether, you know, uh, taxation of public resources is, you know, a good thing or not. You know, or were they afraid of scaring away capital and all this? And um, uh, I had to re re repeat this question three times, and I thought it was a language issue, but I realized that he just thought it was an incredibly stupid question. Uh, because he, he said, no, of course, you know, we... It's a public resource. It belongs to Norwegians. We like money. Why, why wouldn't we want to tax it to the absolute limits of tolerance? I mean, every, every political party was on side with this. Um, this uh, red bar here is, uh, has to do with um, the state's uh, equity stake in uh, state-owned oil companies, Now, which was quite interesting. Um, under Winston Churchill, uh, he converted the, the Royal Navy from coal to uh, oil, which was uh, you know, a, a significant strategic decision and kind of opened up oil as a global commodity. Uh, and uh, as a result, he uh, insisted that they, the, at the time that the UK government own a, a majority stake in British Petroleum because uh, it was such a globally uh, strategic resource. And one of the first things that Margaret Thatcher did when she came to office was to sell off the UK government's um, majority stake in British Petroleum. At the same time, the Norwegians were starting their state-owned oil company from nothing. I mean, the, the British, in comparison, knew a lot about the oil industry, and the Norwegians knew essentially zero. Uh, and there um, was a TV series that I managed to access from Norway, and there was this charming... Uh, recreation of the first days of Stat Oil, where they had rented a two-room office in a small town and their only employee slept on the floor in a sleeping bag. And that's how Stat Oil started. And now they are a multi-billion dollar company, of which um, this, um, that uh, bar there is uh, the, the Norwegian government's uh, equity stake in it, which is uh, $64 billion now. That's, uh, they own about 67% of Stat Oil, and that portion of it is uh, you know, worth uh, $64 billion. At the same time, um, Margaret Thatcher had sold off the stake in um, British Petroleum in the 1980s, and though they did get some revenue from that, had they hung on to that, uh, uh, those shares, they would have been ahead another $67 billion. Um, there's a small bar up there, a um, green one, which is uh, the dividends, because, of course, the Norwegian government uh, is getting dividends from uh, all the shares they own in Stat Oil, and uh, those are worth um, about $23 billion uh, up until 2011. Uh, that purple bar is something quite interesting. It's called the uh, state direct financial interest, and this is really where the Norwegians make most of their money. Uh, and it's, it's something like nationalization, but it's sort of more of a hybrid model. So, for instance, if they're opening up an oil field for exploration and development, the Norwegian government will just say, well, it's our, our resource, and we're going to you know, preferentially you know, give ourselves the best seat at the table. So they'll sort of deal themselves into the game. 
but they don't get that uh, stake in those um, oil leases for nothing. They have to contribute, um, along with their private partners, uh, the same uh, development costs as everybody else, and they're, and they're taking the same risks as uh, private companies as well. So basically, the Norwegian government acts as almost like a senior business partner. Uh, and uh, because they have um, one, if not two, players on the field, uh, they uh, are really able to sort of go through the fine print of what are the real costs and the real profitability of um, uh, the oil business. Uh, here in Canada, uh, for instance, we own zero stake in almost any of our resources, including petroleum. That's uh, either at the federal or the provincial level. Uh, and, you know, frankly, we're taking uh, companies' word for it with regarding the cost and the profitability. You know, we have no way uh, to double-check those numbers because, you know, in Canada, we don't really have uh, state-owned resource companies. And that was one of the real advantages that um, the Norwegians realized from starting Stat Oil. They wanted, you know, basically one of the, the real utilities was to get internal intelligence from within the oil industry about how hard they could push foreign oil companies in terms of uh, resource rents. Uh, and the last one uh, up top is uh, retained reserves. So uh, the Norwegians had um, a state an intention to go slow with their uh, oil development. And because of that, they have oil in the ground that um, is now worth uh, an additional $120 billion. Uh, at least it was when I wrote this article. It's worth quite a bit less now because the price of oil has gone way down. But uh, by the same token, um, the Norwegians actually would have been far ahead of where they are right now had they not caught their own little whiff of Thatcherism in the 1980s where they uh, decided to uh, scale up their oil extraction much higher than they originally intended. And they sold actually most of their oil when it was about $18 a barrel. So had they not made that decision, uh, they would have been ahead uh, an additional about $500 billion dollars but they still did pretty well, certainly in comparison to Canada. <coughs> so you're going to, oh, there we are, good. Okay. Got it. All right. So um, this is another calculation I, I did. I compared, um, this is sort of another way of looking at uh, how profitable the, the public take is in terms of a management over resource. Uh, oil is what they call a fungible commodity. So, you know, um, typically you can, a barrel is a barrel is a barrel. You could, you know, there's certainly distinctions with bitumen as opposed to crude oil. But um, uh, oil engineers have a measure called barrel of oil equivalent. So they basically lump together both natural gas and crude oil. And I looked at the public revenues uh, in 2012 for Norway, the UK, Canada, and specifically Alberta. The Norwegians were realizing about um, $49 uh, per barrel of oil equivalent. Uh, the UK in that year realized a public profit of $20 a barrel. Canada came out at uh, $7.50. And Alberta, $4.06. So the Norwegians are realizing 10 times the benefit from the development of uh, their petroleum resource on a per barrel basis, which is one of the reasons that Alberta has a public debt of $12 billion, if you can believe it. Uh, and they're about to run a deficit of uh, $500 million, and I believe that's their seventh deficit in a row. Yeah, exactly. So uh, one of the people I met in Norway that, to try and help me sort of pull apart why it was that Norway uh, was able to make these decisions that they did and Canada didn't was um, this uh, remarkable individual that I uh, managed to secure an interview with at absolutely the last minute, uh, a man named Rolf Wieberg. And uh, Rolf was a very acerbic character uh, and uh, has an enormous amount of uh, experience in the oil industry. He worked for Philips Petroleum for 19 years. Uh, and uh, recently retired from the Norwegian government, and he moved over there in, I think it was 1998. So he has got a lot of experience on both sides of the table, both in the private uh, sector and in, in the public sector. And Rolf spent, uh, well, after a while, he phoned his wife and said, I'm going to be late for dinner, because uh, I think he was waiting to talk to someone from Canada for quite a while, um, because he had his own personal story. He had done his uh, master's degree at the University of Alberta in the 1970s, and loved Canada so much he uh, was lobbying to move his family there. Uh, 
uh, and uh, his wife disagreed, and um, they, they ended up moving back to Norway. Uh, but one of the reasons he was so enamored with Canada was that, you know, there was some things happening in Alberta in the 1970s that he was very excited about. You know, the, it's hard to believe that, you know, the Lougheed government in the fullness of time is seen as sort of resource visionaries, but they certainly are in comparison to who's running the province now. And, uh, you know, they were starting the Alberta Heritage Fund, and he really thought that Canada was, you know, a very promising uh, country. And uh, in, obviously in the intervening years, Norway became very wealthy and Canada became uh, comparatively impoverished. And he was, you know, personally heartbroken about that. And he, you know, he said, you know, what the hell happened to Canada? I was like, we had oil, but you guys had oil and everything else. Like, what happened to your country? And he told me another story which is sort of indicative of why the Norwegians succeeded and we haven't. Uh, there was a meeting that happened, I think it was in uh, the, I thought it was in the 70s, but Rolf had recently corrected me, he said it was in the 1980s, where the price of oil had gone up, and uh, the Norwegian government said, well, you know, it's our resource, why should you guys uh, realize a windfall profit for the use of our resources? So they decided to increase the level of taxation on oil profits from 50% to close to uh, 80 or 90%. And uh, the oil executives of companies that were active in Norway had demanded a meeting with the Minister of Petroleum. Uh, and the minister showed up with some of his bureaucrats and he listened to these guys pound the table and scream at him for a while and threaten to leave. And after a while he looked at his watch and said, I gotta go. And um, he stood up and he chewed out his bureaucrats right in front of them. He said, you know, why are all these guys still here? If we had taxed them at the proper amount, some of them would have left. We should have taken more. <laughs> and then he walked out. Now, Rolf wasn't in the room, but he had, a lot of people had heard about this meeting. And uh, he described to me, as someone that had spent 19 years working for Phillips Petroleum, that that was exactly the right way to deal with the oil industry. It wasn't intentionally rude. It was tough talk. And he said, people in the oil industry understand tough talk, because that's how they deal with each other. And, you know, at that point, they had, in his words, respect. And Norway really has no problem attracting capital or people wanting to do business there. As a matter of fact, companies are lining up to do business in Norway because they're getting something in Norway that they don't get here, which is certainty. You have companies that are investing billions of dollars in the oil sands, and they can't get any other oil to market. Why? Because there's no national buy-in to our oil industry partly because Albertans have been assuring the country for many decades that it's not Canada's oil, it's Alberta's oil. But here in British Columbia, I think many of us are rightly asking, well, what's in it for us to have pipelines across our, our province or tankers off our coast when we're not going to realize any benefit from that? And the situation in Norway is entirely opposite because, you know, a, a large amount of their very generous social programs are funded by them driving probably the hardest bargain in the world with the world's most powerful industrial sector. Now, how did Norway do this? They are a very small country, and back in the 1970s, they were a small, poor country. And believe me, I mean, my uncle used to, uh, uh, he uh, went to the University of Calgary, and he dropped out in first year because he became a landman. Uh, he, his job was to go around and talk to farmers in Alberta and basically talk them out of their subsurface mineral rights. And there was a lot of money to be made during that, and he ended up spending his whole career in the oil industry and uh, became a vice president of Mobile Oil. And um, the, the question is, like, why didn't we replicate what Norway did? Like, what was it about the Norwegian um, situation that allowed them to drive such a harder bargain? with uh, outside oil interests. And you know, the reason I told that story about my uncle is that you know, he spent a lot of his career going around to countries like Libya and Saudi Arabia. And you know, believe me, the oil industry was used to getting their way. Uh, and I'm sure that they thought that they weren't going to have too much trouble with Norway. Uh, but they did. And uh, which brings me to the third and probably most important piece of wisdom that, uh, that Rolf imparted on me. He said, we're wasting our time talking about Norwegian policies. As a matter of fact, we stole a lot of our oil policies from places like Alberta because we knew nothing about the oil industry. We flew our bureaucrats around the world to try and get examples of best policy practices. The difference is we succeeded because of the Norwegian attitude. And unless you have a Norwegian attitude of just going toe-to-toe -to -toe with whoever is coming to use your resources, 
you're not going to succeed. Which got me thinking about the sort of the cultural differences and the, the sort of intersection of culture and resource management. Why is it that Norway and Canada ended up in such vastly different places? <coughs> now, I thought I'd put up a gratuitous shot of some half-dressed Vikings for the hell of it. Is everybody okay with that? Um, <laughs> sure. Um, and I, when I was in Norway, I visited, uh, there was uh, sort of a museum of uh, Viking culture, and I was talking to a guy there, and, you know, we in North America have uh, a very different view of Viking history than uh, is, you know, being uh, understood in Norway. Um, the, the Vikings that existed, or the people that were in Scandinavia over a thousand years ago, uh, were kind of the, the last pagans in Europe. And uh, the empire that sort of filled the void after the fall of the Roman Empire was uh, Charlemagne's empire. And it was almost um, an alliance between the military and the church. And Charlemagne was on a very spirited campaign to forcibly subjugate and convert every pagan in Europe. And uh, was making steady progress. There was a rather gruesome story from around 800 AD where he had um, forcibly baptized 4,500 Saxons in northern Germany and then cut their heads off. Uh, and at which point the leader of the Saxons had escaped to Denmark uh, and sought um, refuge with uh, his brother-in-law, who happened to be the king of present-day Denmark, and I'm sure shared stories of what was coming in their, in their way. And uh, the inhabit inhabitants of present-day Scandinavia probably had uh, no hope whatsoever of defeating Charlemagne on the conventional battlefield, but um, I'm sure people in this room have read, uh, uh, many people have read a book called Guns, Germs, and Steel, which sort of uh, tries to answer that question about why sort of so-called Western forces uh, almost uh, invariably uh, uh, defeated the sort of pagan people they came in contact with. And the idea that I'm exploring is that, you know, the, the Vikings were kind of the outlier in that theory. Uh, they had resistance to the same disease, uh, they had access to the same, if not uh, better, military technology, including this, which is the Viking longboat, which was basically an instrument of war. Uh, and um, one of the reasons, oh, well, the case I'm making is that uh, one of the reasons that Norway is so fabulously wealthy is because, partly due to their, their essentially an unconquered First Nation. The people that exist in Norway have been there since the last Ice Age, or at least since the Iron Age. Uh, and uh, there was a story that this historian told me when I was uh, visiting him at the University of Oslo, was that um, uh, the, looking at the oil industry, you have to go about 60 or 80 years before that to see the roots of what happened. Um, the first in industrialists had started buying up Norwegian resources in the early part of the 20th century. They were uh, building hydroelectric dams. Uh, and um, they started uh, purchasing pieces of Norway, holus bolus, that uh, families had continuously occupied since the Iron Age. And the Norwegians were so uh, outraged about this, they forced their government to call, uh, pass something colloquially called now the Panic Laws. And the Panic Laws basically put a break on all outside industrial investment until the Norwegians decided for themselves how they were going to engage with outside investors. And uh, the position they came up with is, okay, you guys can come in with your capital. You can build your um, hydroelectric dams because, you know, we are not opposed to development. We're not opposed to electricity. But you're going to operate these dams for a term of 40 to 60 years, and then they revert to the Norwegian crown. They belong to us. And you guys have made your money. You go away. And in the meantime, you're going to show us how to build these things and operate them. And then you're going to screw off. <laughs> and... Around that time, when a bunch of these leases came due on their uh, hydro development uh, projects is when they had uh, discovered oil, and they basically adopted the same position with uh, foreign oil companies, saying, You're, you, okay, you guys can come in. We don't know anything about uh, the oil industry. You certainly know how to, to uh, drill 100 kilometers off the Norwegian coast, which is you know, very challenging for some of the, the richest oil companies in the world at the time. Uh, but you're going to show us how to do it, uh, you're going to show us how to build these things. You're going to speak Norwegian on the oil rigs. Uh, and after a period of time, those oil rigs belong to us. You can go screw yourselves. And the, they, it's that really, it's that Norwegian attitude that's allowed them to succeed where, where we haven't. And I'd like to contrast this with uh, the, 
the last provincial election in Alberta. This is another uh, example of a uh, terrible PowerPoint slide, but I'm going to um, try and read some of this text to you because it's just so incredible. Uh, this is a story that ran in the Financial Post, uh, and it was uh, from March of 2012, and it looked at the time like the Wild Rose Alliance was going to form a majority government in Alberta, which, you know, again, is to the right of the Conservative Party, which has held power for 40 years in Alberta. This is how they framed it. A heated political election is in the air in Alberta with two strong women who are fighting for top job and the oil industry and its sugar daddies are being courted for financial and f political support. It's a sharp U-turn from the days of former Premier Ed Stelmach who picked an acrimonious fight with the sector to squeeze a greater share of its resource revenues through higher royalties. But the Oil Love Fest was on full display this week as Alison Redford, the new Tory Premier of Alberta, made a strategic stop in Calgary before an audience of 600 senior oil and gas industry leaders where she vowed to, quote, stand up for your interests and, quote, not let you down. So, obviously, Canada and, uh, or excuse me, Norway and Alberta have arrived in very different places. And I'm sort of interested in, like, why that happened. Uh, because, you know, Canada and Norway share uh, a, a northern European heritage. But, you know, I think comparatively Canada is culturally much more of a blank slate than Norway was. Uh, and a colleague of mine uh, wrote a very interesting and somewhat depressing book uh, about um, the sort of very long-term campaign of uh, various right-wing think tanks to change Canadian culture. To, through, you know, and I, I think you really have to give people on the right credit because they play a, a long, patient, uh, they're very good at what they call the long game, these very long, patient, well-resourced campaigns to uh, infuse public discourse, what uh, people read in the newspaper, what, they're, what kids are taught in school, uh, and, you know, very gradually undermining our faith in public institutions and, you know, just giving people the idea that, you know, privatization is a good thing. And... Why wouldn't you want to do that when there's $33 trillion of resources on the table? I mean, if you can convince the electorate that uh, you should vote against uh, politicians that are demanding a higher share of resource grants, as has happened in Alberta, and I just referenced that in that piece in the, in the Financial Post, I mean, you know, it's not like there isn't voices in Alberta that are, that are calling for an increase in resource royalties. As a matter of fact, there was a, a blue ribbon panel uh, during Ed Stelmach's reign that, you know, said very bluntly that uh, the Alberta government is not getting its sh fair share of uh, resource rents and hasn't for some time. And he tried to implement those uh, recommendations and he got kicked out of office for it. Um, this is another very egregious example of uh, how the sort of the, how the rubber hits the road in campaigns like this. This is a story that ran in the Vancouver Observer and um, it was a, uh, what they call a slide deck that was leaked to Twitter. Uh, and it shows this uh, sort of a joint venture between the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers and uh, Post Media, which owns most of the daily papers in Canada. Uh, and uh, spending some time in the media, I can tell you that uh, most of the sort of bricks and mortar operations are, are in serious financial trouble. A lot of people are accessing their news for free online. Uh, and newsrooms all around the country have been depopulated from, uh, of, you know, good journalists. Uh, and uh, instead, what newspapers are doing to pay the bills is to, unfortunately, form partnerships with, you know, some of the people that more rightly should be buying advertising from them. So this slide deck was chilling, actually, because it sort of d displayed in quite a large amount of detail how... Uh, the Association of Petroleum Producers was going to have their worldview inserted into Canada's national newspapers and disguised as news and editorial. Um, now, everything I've talked about so far has been, you know, fairly depressing, but I think there, there is definitely some other balls in the air, and um, this is one of the stories that I covered earlier this year. Um, I made the case that uh, one of the reasons that Norway had succeeded uh, so strongly in uh, driving a hard bargain with outside resource interest is they had such a strong kind of cultural connection to the land. And I, you know, they're essentially like an unconquered First Nation. And uh, First Nations here in Canada are having more and more influence over resource development. And I, I was just up in the Chilcotin uh, in uh, late October this year. 
uh, covering a very interesting story. The Chilcotin had uh, started a court challenge about 10 or 15 years ago that uh, succeeded rather spectacularly at uh, the Supreme Court of Canada. And um, they basically had a declaration from Canada's highest court that uh, their traditional territories basically belonged to them. And the provincial government had no business sort of imposing their policies on it. And uh, to mark that, the Chilcotin had declared a territorial park uh, that was about half the size of Prince Edward Island. Uh, and one of the things I'm interested in is, is there examples here in Canada now or in the future where First Nations are demonstrating that they have a, a greater cultural likelihood of replicating the uh, Norwegian success story than non-native Canada. Uh, and I think, you know, non-native Canada, you know, I'm certainly not native, and uh, I think in comparison to, like, the, how Norwegians view their landscape, it's, you know, every, every one of us in this room, or most of us have, you know, are, you know, reasonably recent immigrants. And, you know, in comparison to uh, Norway, it's, it's almost like, you know, non-native Canada won a fully furnished house in a sweepstakes and then had a yard sale. Because we don't have that sort of sense of ownership over our uh, land base. And this is one of the things that Peter Lougheed was really uh, urging people in Alberta to think like an owner. And uh, I really think you need to approach the negotiating table with that attitude if you're, if you're going to succeed. Um, I'm almost finished, but I wanted to touch on uh, climate change. This is another example of a terrible PowerPoint slide. Um, but um, obviously one of the big stories uh, in petroleum these days is the collapse in the price of oil. And um, also the uh, overarching issue is uh, climate change and what to do about it. And uh, interestingly, there's a very strong connection between those two things. I used to, in a previous life, work in the mining business. And um, uh, when you were working at the mine, uh, there, it was fairly arbitrary or sort of a moving target what rock you would dig out of the ground would end up going to the mill or the waste rock pile. And that had to do with your cost and the price of the resource on any given day. Uh, and the same applies to the oil industry. Uh, and uh, with a collapse in the price of oil, uh, what you have is the recoverable reserves in places like northern Alberta has basically collapsed. Uh, because it is a very high cost and uh, marginal resource, uh, the, the profitable extractable reserves has, has really um, fallen through the floor. Now, there's a, a group in the UK uh, who produced this graph that you, I'm sure you can barely see. Um, but it was a very fascinating study. What they did is they uh, looked at um, the scientific literature and estimated how much carbon has to stay in the ground to avoid catastrophic climate change. And um, that figure there is um, uh, 360 gigatons of carbon. And uh, the, uh, this particular graph has to do with the oil industry. And uh, what they're saying is that any global price of oil that uh, is below a break-even point of $60 a barrel or a market price, more importantly, of $75 a barrel is uh, going to put us in a much safer territory around climate change. Uh, and uh, there's also a taxation aspect to this as well. I think um, most governments in the world are charging reasonable resource rents. I think Norway is kind of towards one end of the spectrum and Alberta is definitely towards the other. But you could make a case that Alberta is not just sort of ripping themselves off by charging so low resource rents. They're also um, contributing to a, a future climate catastrophe by uh, making uh, oil extractable that uh, should, uh, by all uh, yards, economic yardsticks, probably not come out of the ground. So if, like, if Alberta was charging a more responsible resource rent, then... Um, uh, a lot of uh, the material in northern Alberta uh, wouldn't be recoverable reserves, which I think is one of the reasons that they aren't charging a resource rent because, you know, they discovered the oil sands uh, over 150 years ago and no one really scaled up any kind of production there until very recently, until the price of oil got above $80 a barrel. This is um, another graph from this group called um, Climate uh, Carbon Tracker, uh, and it's from the same report, and it... Um, is indicating just how exposed um, uh, petroleum developments are in northern Alberta. And I'll, I'll just try and point out some of the salient facts in this. The, um, the, the bar across the top is um, 
Alberta and all the um, uh, all the other uh, line items on there are um, other jurisdictions in the world. And what they're showing there is the um, uh, what they call uh, capital expenditures for projects above a break-even point of $80 a barrel. And um, I can see that that bar in Alberta is about $400 billion of capital expenditures that depend on an oil price above $80 a barrel. So Alberta is really in a pickle, unfortunately. Uh, and, but, you know, this is also an opportunity as well. Um, there we are. So um, the party's about to end in Alberta. Uh, I've been talking about uh, how they've been kind of getting ripped off on resource rents for a long time. Uh, but, you know, it's pretty hard to talk up to a drunk about their drinking while they're drunk. But uh, it's an excellent opportunity to talk to a drunk about their drinking when they're hungover. And Alberta, unfortunately, is about to have a very, very large hangover. Um, and I'd just like to leave you with that thought, or this thought, to uh, borrow a slogan from a well-known bank. In Canada, you're richer than you think. And we could do a lot better uh, if we aim higher and think like an owner. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mitch.